Okay. Good evening, uh, Department of Architecture. Um, Betcha Welch is with us today. Uh, this is the second evening in the series, so we kicked it off last week with Tim Greenhall from Fitch. And there we looked into design as a field. Today, uh, Berta will be looking at architects as pro property developers. So this is kind of another side of the uh, education, the training that you're getting, and how you consider next step in the industry. So Berta, of course, will talk about herself uh, in terms of introduction, but give you an overview. Berta is an architect, studied in the UK, then moved on to uh, working in the United States, especially in New York, with a focus on um, her role being developing property as an architect. Okay, so what we'll do, like usual, we'll keep the questions to the end of the session. Um, so make sure you don't start, uh, disturb, but also stop the speaker. But make sure you have those questions ready at the end. We can answer uh, uh, either as a panel or either better. We'll be answering them. Okay? So maybe a warm welcome to Berta. Thank you for coming today. So yeah, my name is Berta Willis. I'm an architect and a real estate developer uh, with 14 years experience uh, in London and New York City. And I am here because I want to plant an idea in your head. I want you to finish university and go out into the work workplace and really change our industry. I think architects add tremendous value to buildings, um, and but our profession has been massively devalued. And architects don't get what they deserve out of the development process. We are often at the mercy of our clients, and sometimes we're just executing other people's visions. Obviously, there's the Peter Zumters of the world that can afford to demand more control over the projects, but the majority of us are going to face major constraints in our work. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, ways of approaching architecture uh, with an entrepreneurial spirit so that you can go out into the real world and really disrupt our industry. But first I want to tell you a little bit about how I got here. I did my degree and diploma uh, at, in Liverpool. My first uh, job was my year out in Shepherd Robson. And I spent the best part of that year drawing toilet details and doing hardware schedules, which really sucked. And I quickly realized that if I wanted to, unless I wanted to do this for the rest of my life, I was gonna have to excel over and above my peers. So I really applied myself during the diploma and I graduated with a distinction. I went back to the workplace wanting to get something built. Uh, above all things, I just wanted to see my drawings turn into, a, into reality, into a real building. But it actually took me three years and three jobs at Simpson Hoff and Edgar West and AHMM to get something off the drawing board. When I joined AHMM, I felt like I had struck gold. I was put on the Angel Building. I was drawing emergency stairs to begin with, but I actually worked my way through the building and I ended up doing a lot of packages, including like the cladding, the reception, even things like rug design. The construction was not without its hiccups, but the contractor really wanted the best results, so did the client. So we, you know, everybody was cooperating to get the best building possible. And it was the only time in my life to date that the planets aligned and everybody seemed to be working towards this goal. The project was nominated for the starting prize and became a great success. And I really felt like I was on top of the world. The client, Derwin London, they were so happy with us that they took us out for dinner and they bought me this silver box as a gift to say thank you. So I spent a few months basking in the glory of the angel building. And I was still on cloud nine when they gave me my next, my next project, which was 10 New Burlington Street for the Crown Estate. This was another big budget project for a prestigious client, so I was really happy. And uh, this project I was gonna run myself. I had a team of seven people uh, during the most intense period doing like the construction uh, set. 
And I was doing a bit of everything, design, project management, like drawing, production, review. I was giving and uh, putting together every client presentation. So I was working insane hours. And as the construction progressed, I realized this project was going to be very tough to deliver. The building was uh, turning out beautiful, but the process really started to burn, to burn me out. And I started thinking, when all of this is over, what am I going to get? A silver box again? I wasn't going to get another bonus. I, uh, sorry, I wasn't going to get a bonus. And, you know, where is all this effort and all this work going to come out the other end? Um, my client was going to fill their pockets, but I was just going to be given the next building to deliver. I saw myself I'm making this beautiful pie, and you're like spending ages doing it and putting it together and to make it perfect. And then you give it to your clients, and this is what they do with it. <laughs> I wanted my piece of the pie. I wanted to be my own client. I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to make all the decisions. I wanted to allocate the budget to whatever I thought was important. And I just wanted more power. This meant that I had to become a developer. But to me, this meant moving to the dark side, becoming commercial, the dirty word, right? I didn't want to give up design and creativity to get behind a computer crunching numbers. So I was wondering if there were architects that were also developers. You know, you've heard of musicians and directors becoming their own producers, but is this, was this happening in my industry? So I did a bit of research and I found that there were, and mostly they were in the U.S., and there were a handful of very successful firms in New York City. So after 10 years of working as an architect in London, I put everything that I owned in storage, and I moved. I enrolled in some part-time uh, real estate finance classes at U New York University, uh, and after a few months of uh, sending CVs out, which I won't bore you with the difficulty of doing that, I joined Avery Hall Investments as their first employee. My bosses have a great, back, uh, varied, and very varied background uh, in private equity, property management, and architecture. And after four years in business, we are now 11 people, and we have several major projects uh, in the pipeline. At Avery Hall, we do everything from acquiring the land, designing the building, managing the construction, and selling or renting the asset at the end of it. We are architects and developers, but this is just one way of being a property developer. So let's talk about that a little bit more. What is a developer? A developer creates value out of land and buildings. A developer buys land and renovates extends or builds buildings. You can call yourself a developer if you buy a house, you get it, you renovate it, and you sell it. You can also call yourself a developer if you buy a building and you turn it into, say, private rentals, and then you keep that building so that it gives you like a monthly income. That's called a cash flowing asset. Depending on which way you go in your career, Developers will most likely be your clients, and they will determine the fate of your buildings and your designs. So what makes architects good developers? What makes you a good developer? Education, I think, is one thing. Like, architects generally uh, learn traits that I think uh, make for much better developers than someone with a finance degree. And this is because you can see opportunities where others may not be able to. For example, this is Slender Bender, which is a terrible name, but this is by Deadline, it's an architecture firm in Berlin. They bought a narrow site uh, that nobody had any interest in because it was kind of like awkward. They bought it with a mortgage. They developed it, they extended it, and now they manage it as an apartment hotel. And they use this for income. What this means is that they can be more choosy with the architectural commissions that they take on. Approach is another thing. Architects have design sensibility. They care about green space, sustainability. They care about natural light. Architects know the difference that good architecture can make in communities, 
in schools and people's well-being and behavior. Another one is you understand construction. Like once you guys go out there and you build a couple of things, you will fairly quickly understand what it takes to design and construct a building. And this is knowledge that not many developers have because they have a finance background mostly. Especially when you're a project architect, you will perform various roles, like leading a project team, you know, working with contractors, managing a schedule. Like this versatility in your experience is extremely useful. Good design adds value. And I'm not just talking about an architect doing one of these concepts for micro, teeny, tiny apartments. You know, people will always pay a premium for something that is unique and special. This is 41 Bond Street in New York City. They built, uh, they built in planters with a full-on irrigation system and drainage into the facade so that the plants can, can grow like that. And the apartment sold like hotcakes. Like going into that level of complexity to grow plants is a, is a strong value move. Lastly, you understand how cities work. You know, good architects understand the importance of context and the impact that architecture has in cities. Architects are more likely to think about what a neighbor, neighborhood needs than a traditional developer would. This means that architects are more likely to reconcile profit making with a broader um, uh, strategy for social change. Now, what makes architects bad developers? This is the fun part. Oops. The first one is a lack of understanding of business and finance. I think that I received a good architectural education in the UK, but I do wish that I had been taught some business and economics. The fees toolkit is not enough. Architects face immense competition from one another and they severely undercut one another. A developer may really like your work, but they're gonna say, hey, why are you charging me more than this other guy? And you may say, I'm better. But the likelihood is that you're gonna face a choice, lower your fees or risk losing that commission. And typically architects will choose the former, which means that the cycle of devaluing of the profession just goes on and on. A lack of understanding of the real estate market. So developers really need to understand the real estate market. This means knowing what there is land and you know, properties to develop, but it's also understanding what is the highest and best use. And that's the official term for uh, you know, the optimal use of land that is physically possible and will generate the highest value. You're never, or you're probably never, going to be approached by a client that says, hey, what do you think we should put here? They're gonna say, I want you to design me a hotel or a residential building or, you know, whatever, like office. The vision of what should populate a site is usually set by the time that the architect enters the building process. Understanding the real estate market also means uh, knowing the timing of your building and what else you know, is going on around you. The real estate market is cyclical like the economy, so it goes up and down. So imagine that you find a great piece of land and you can build offices on it. But your building is going to take three or five years by the time it gets built. And maybe the market has softened by then or the demand is like really low. Or even worse, there's another building, another office building next year's that is finished before you. So keeping your finger on the pulse of um, the real estate market is, is crucial. And I feel that architects are not often aware of it. Putting design above value, this is my favorite. I used to do this all the time with my clients at, for the Angel Building and New Burlington Street. I would dig my heels and fight for the purity of design for the expensive finishes, for the Danish taps. And the one I remember the most was the, the bathrooms at New Burlington Street. We had this trough arrangement in the bathrooms, which meant that if you were carrying a bag, you had nowhere to put it other than the floor. So I insisted that we put some hooks under the trough so you can hang your bag while you're washing your hands. 
but it was a complete shit show. Like, we had to reinforce the frame. We had to, like, add this carpentry piece around the bins. And in the end, you couldn't even see the hooks. It's a complete waste of time and money. This detail did not add any value. Architects are often focused only on design. And there's a general disregard for the financial part of the building. But I really think that this mindset needs to change. Knowing what your budget is means that you can tailor your building to it, rather than propose something extremely ambitious that is then going to be value engineered to the bare bones. Through my work uh, in the development side, I have learned the meaning of value. And at every crossroads, cr sorry, crossroads in the design process, I ask myself, like, does this add value? And this doesn't just mean a monetary value. It actually means, does this make the building better in a meaningful way? So why do we need to disrupt our industry? The elephant in the room is that the building industry is a business. It is one of the most profitable and more stable types of businesses uh, types of investments in the world. And you as architects bring tremendous value to this business. So I want you to think about what you're going to do when you get out into the workplace. Don't just sit and wait by the phone for a client to bring you work. Like go out and find the work yourself and go get a piece of the pie. How do we do this? There are many ways to do this and I've split it into small, medium and large. So if you're not up for taking big risks, just work with what you have. Talk to your client. Would they be open to a profit share uh, on the project, you know, in, in exchange for lower fees, perhaps? Or would they consider a bonus structure? Uh, you know, you can say, I can build you this building in X months. If I improve the program by one month, I get three grand. If I improve it by two months, I get seven grand. This kind of arrangement is always done with contractors. You know, the contractor gets a bonus if they finish on time. So what you're doing is you're sharing the risk with your client. And you're getting paid a little bit less at the beginning with the incentive of a little bit extra at the end. So if you lead a project to completion too early, you should be rewarded for it. For Medium, I want to talk about crowdfunding and co-housing. So crowdfunding, uh, Bjarke Engels of BIG raised 30 grand, he was aiming for 15, to develop a steam rain generator at a power plant, at a Copenhagen power plant. Also, this was done for the renovation of the Jennings Hotel in Oregon. Um, they actually raised like over $100,000 to renovate it as hotels, as hotel and apartments. And they offered incentives like from a custom key ring to the right to take over the entire hotel for like a weekend if you contribute like $2,000 or something like this. So if you have a project in mind that you think would benefit your local community, just start a crowdfunding campaign. Like you really don't lose anything for trying. For co-housing, I want to talk about uh, Baugruppen. It's German for building group. You may have heard of this. It's a concept that is usually led by an architect. They find a location where multiple people want to live, they get these people together, and they design and build the property, which eventually everybody co-owns. So everybody invests a chunk of capital, uh, and then they get to, to design the homes uh, with your help, or with the architect's help. And, but the architect can also contribute their work as capital, and this is called sweat equity. Uh, which means that you, instead of being paid a fee, you invest your work as your capital contribution. Baugruppen is uh, popular in Berlin, but it's also spreading to places like Australia. Um, this is Spreefeld. Um, it's a three-building complex by three different architects. This project not only provides great homes, but it also features spaces that like foster social interaction like they have co-working space within the building and a playground and even like a teenager club. Uh, both group and projects usually, you know, bring together like-minded groups of people that are probably interested in like sustainable living. 
which means that everybody's like working towards, you know, building this building, following those principles. So Baugruppen is actually leading the way in environmental sustainability by, for example, using high-rise timber construction, like the E3 by Kadenlager, which is a seven-story timber building, is the first of its kind in Europe. Also, these users and owners may be open to using new technology, like uh, the fold-out balconies you can see on the right, which were designed because the city planning didn't allow for per permanent balconies. So large. So if you want to go large, we're talking about a fully integrated architecture and development firm. So I'm going to talk to you about the, my top three architecture development firms uh, with a focus on four things, which is money, sites, construction, and sales. So let's start with money. I want to talk about Tamarkin Co. Um, Carrie Tamarkin was an architect for 10 years. He got tired of having no control over his projects and not making enough money. So he went searching for sites. He found a warehouse to convert. And he made a list of 100 people that he, think, he thought that he could borrow money from. He worked his way down the list, and through a relative, he came across this other guy that was running a real estate fund. The fund guy invested, and he made 75% return, which is amazing. And Carrie made nearly $1 million. After that, Carrie did incredibly well. He, uh, he bought a couple of sites right next to the High Line, the dealer's Cofidio Elevated Park, that I'm sure you're, aware, you're um, familiar with. This building is 456 West 19th, which is pretty amazing because it, it features double high living rooms on most apartments. Like most developers would just build single high and you double your floor area to sell. But Carrie knew how special these would be and how people would be happy to pay extra for this luxury. He also recently finished 10 Sullivan Street. The site was a tricky one because it's a very narrow junction. And I'm sure that other developers probably thought that it was too risky, you know, like there's not enough value there. But so Carrie probably got this site a little cheaper than your average piece of uh, Soho uh, land. Um, I'm not saying you have to love his work, but I think the building is very successful at making the most out of the space available. So Gary got lucky when he came to finding the money, but you don't have to be rich to develop. You need to find investors and lenders. Every project has a part of equity, which is cash, and debt, which is typically a loan. So equity is the money that you put down yourself or the money that you get from private investors. Generally, you do it, you use that for the early stage stuff, like buying the land, doing a planning application. And investors can be any of these, real estate funds, hedge funds, or just businesses that are looking to invest in real estate. For example, one of the investors on the building I'm doing in New York is a plumbing business that we used to work with. The plumber is a wealthy guy, and he's looking to grow his money. We presented the investment opportunity, and he, de he decided to put money down like contribute equity. Investors are not that hard to find. There are agents that represent hedge funds and high net worth individuals that go around looking for opportunities to invest. Also, real estate agents can be your allies when looking for investors because they often make transactions uh, with people that are buying property as investments and they get to know the types of buildings and sites that they're interested in. The best way to increase your chances of coming across these people is to partner up with finance, law, students. I know that this may not sound very appealing, but your skills combined with theirs is really a killer combo. So for that, once you have a site um, and you know probably planning approval and, and, and a price for your construction, you can go to the bank and you ask for a construction loan. This is a bit more strict than a normal loan because what you're borrowing against doesn't exist yet. It's just a pile of nothing. So the first loan that you ask for you know, is going to be tough. Negotiations, probably high interest rates, and you know lots of clauses to protect the bank and leave you with all the risk. 
so you do need uh, the help of attorneys or a finance adv financial advisor. So how do you split the profits? The rule that we all know is that if you invest 1%, you get 1% of the profit, right? Well, not in development. Because the developer carries a lot of the risk, they could potentially get a larger share of the profit than what they themselves invest. And this is called promote, which is a word you should remember. So let's talk about how that works. All right, imagine you're going to renovate a townhouse to sell. It's going to cost $1 million to, or pounds to buy and renovate, but you think it's going to sell for $1.3 million. So you come to me and you ask me to invest. I think you're a good architect. I think you're going to do a good job, but I want to make sure that you're not just going to lose my money. So I offer you the following deal. I give you the $1 million, but you promise to pay me back a minimum of 100000 on top of the million, regardless of what happens, even if the deal dies and the building never gets done. This is called a preferred return. But I also want a share of what you're going to make. So I offer you this tier structure. If your prediction is correct and you sell for 1.3 million, we share the remaining money 50-50. So we get 100 each. So let's just run through this quickly. The cost is 1 million. Sales prediction, 1.3, so your expected returns are 300,000, which is 30%. So we're in the two-star 50-50 bracket. You have to pay me 100,000 of preferred return regardless. So there's 200,000 left to distribute. If you mess it up and you only make 20%, I take the lion's share of the profits. So I take 70% and you take 30. But... If you exceed expectations and you make over 40% return, then you can take 70% of that and I keep only 30. So off you go, you buy the house, you start the project, but guess what? The construction gets complicated, things go wrong and the construction ends up costing 1.1 million. So you still have to pay me the 100,000 that you guaranteed. So you're now in the lower tier and the one star which means that I keep 70% of that 100, and you're only gonna make 30,000 on this deal, which is a nightmare, right? So you put the house in the market, and guess what? You actually end up selling it for 1.5 million. So now you have triggered the upper tier, and you can take home $210,000, which when you think about, this is a $1 million deal, that's a pretty big chunk of uh, rewards. The investor always gets paid first, which is why they're the first glass in the champagne tower. And only when their glass is full, uh, you can get your share. You take all the risk, but you stand to make a lot of money if you do well. And considering that you're the one running the show, you have the power to make this happen. So let's talk about money now. Sorry, let's talk about sites now, now that we cover money. A great architecture and development firm that I really like is Alloy. The, found, the founders are a businesswoman and an architect. The architect, Jared, was practicing for many years, and as a way of generating work for his firm, he partnered with one of his clients uh, to buy and develop properties. After a while, he dissolved uh, his architecture firm and he founded Alloy. Uh, they developed mostly in Brooklyn, in Dumbo specifically. And this is their latest building, uh, 1 John Street, right by the Manhattan Bridge. Alloy developed in Dumbo because that is what they know best. And this is really crucial. You always have to stick to what you know. Only look for sites and buildings in areas that you know very well. Or go and scout areas, but, and you need to scout them until you know them like the palm of your hand. Cycle around them. Drive around them. Um, during the day and during the night. Take note of people patterns, screen spaces, thick school districts, parking availability, public transport links. All of those are crucial factors. Look at what the planning policies are in these areas. What is selling there at the moment? I got, this is again when 
real estate agents are your best friends because they have a finger in the pulse and they know what's um, what's lacking and what's fetching the highest prices. So yeah, Loi is are based in Dumbo and they have done most of their work within a two mile radius of their office. So whenever a good site opens up in Dumbo, they're the first ones to snatch it up. There's no chance for anybody else to get in there. This is their Dumbo townhouses, which is you know pretty nice. The, the houses themselves are very narrow, they're like 18 feet, but they feature these mezzanine levels, so they're four and a half stories, which is quite unusual to find. The building envelope is uh, tensile concrete panels. It's like a new concrete technology that allows the concrete to be cast in very delicate proportions. No plain thinking developer would risk uh, using this technology for the sake of making fins out of concrete. But an architect developer could see how distinctive this would make their project in the neighborhood, so they went for it. Let's talk about construction now. Um, and I want to show you the work of DDG Partners. They are the Rolls Royce of architect developers. They have offices in New York City, Florida, and California. It was founded in 2009 by an architect, a developer, a lawyer, and a private equity investor. So for the first couple of years, they started small. They were just buying houses, renovating them, moving on to the next one. The breakthrough project was 41 Bond, which I showed you before. DDG do really special buildings that are not easy to build. So they manage the construction themselves. They're actually contractors. And this is to mitigate risk. Like contractors can make or break your project. As an architect developers, uh, developer, contractors need to be fully on your side, and you need to have a very good, solid relationship with them. You obviously need to check their track record and you know, make sure that they've done these things before, etc. This is uh, Shoko, which used to be a chocolate factory in Soho. Uh, DDG created this crazy, gaudy esque facade made out of cast aluminum. Uh, even if this is not your cup of tea, you have to admire the ambition. DDG pride, them, pride themselves in, um, in like, uh, um, the process, the design process that they follow through. I know they're always like promoting their buildings, you know, for the craft, the greenery, the love of materials. Um, like we talked before about Alois townhouses, you know, architect developers are more likely to consider innovative and creative solutions. While traditional developers, they, all they want to do is try and test it uh, stuff. CDG's latest adventure is uh, this building on the Upper East Side. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Um, fair face concrete, stones, brass cladding. They bought the land for $70 million, and they plan to sell for 300. So you work out the promote on that. The last thing I want to talk about is sales. So both Aloy and DDG Partners, they get involved in their sales campaign. Um, this is 182 Water Street in Brooklyn. Aloy did this with a super low budget. They took a warehouse, they converted it, with uh, very simple materials. But before they started the construction, they photographed the warehouse and they put this ad on like journals um, showing these very mysterious spaces. Everybody wanted to know what this was going to be like. They didn't have any money, so like for, you know, to create like a sales office or a model apartment. So they just commissioned an artist to paint the plans on each apartment uh, sorry, on, on each um, of each apartment on the floor, uh, including the furniture, and it just looks so cool. I, I wish I had more pictures of this. This is the finished building. Generally, you can start selling off plan as soon as you start the construction. Timing is very important. Uh, don't try to sell at the same time as your competitor, as unless you have a very different product to them. And if you have an apartment that say is very special and you know it's going to sell really quickly, just don't put that in the market right away. Just save it for later. 
But the most important thing is don't get greedy. It is very important to sell out your properties very quickly rather than making a higher profit. Um, so have your target price in mind. And if you can close a deal immediately, do it. In the same way that Aloy um, posted these mysterious photos of the lofts, uh, DDG Partners created a lot of hype with 345 meatpacking. They made a deal with the Whitney Museum, and during the construction, they covered the scaffold with a crazy Jajoy Kusama print. And it made the building look like this crazy box in the street. Everybody was so excited to see the building finished. Everybody in New York knew about it, and it really solidified DDG's name as one of the biggest in the city. So just to wrap up, one last note. Please go and disrupt our industry. Don't wait for the phone to ring and a client to call you and tell you what to do. In embrace entre entrepreneurship. Look for projects um, that you want to do. Look for sites that need to be developed. Know your value. The building industry is a business, and you bring tremendous value to it. Partner up with others. Finance, law, real estate agents. Learn from them. Use their knowledge. Make a difference. Take charge and go build something out of the ordinary, something that no plain thinking developer would think to build. Go get your piece of the pie. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Berta. Okay, so we're going to open up the questions. Um, maybe if you want to ask questions for you and ask them at any point to you. So, first question who would, who would want to go to the first question? Yeah. Um, so, you did a call when you went to New York. Can you get around the world? Well, it was just uh, part time classes, like evening classes in real estate finance. Um, New York University offers these. Um, like very basic finance um, classes for you know anybody to take and like very cheap as well. Um, and look, I learned some of the lingo there. I don't feel like I learned that much out of it, but just uh, you know, I was able to speak that language by the end of it. So this is something that I was actually so I was lecturing. I was giving this talk in Cardiff yesterday. And a lot of people were asking me, where do I learn this stuff? And I just wish that this was being integrated into our education uh, as part of the architecture course. And at the moment, it is not. And um, I actually talked to Cardiff about putting together a Finance 101 class. So if there's interest here, I'll be happy to do that here too. <laughs> No, I mean, here's the thing. I, I got a little bit lucky because these guys, uh, my bosses, the partners in my firm, you know, they were desperately looking for somebody that could that had uh, interest in development and architecture background because they wanted to uh, build a model, a business uh, around the model of architecture development. So my background interested them. Uh, and the fact that I had been doing these finance classes, I managed to, you know, impress them in the interview enough that uh, they gave me the job. So, but I know that, um, for example, the Crown Estate, the uh, client that I did 10 New Burlington Street for, uh, the head of uh, the Crown Estate is this woman called Alison Nemo. And she spoke at a conference uh, last week where she talked about wanting to uh, hire more designers and architects and engineers into the Crown Estate um, just because they want that expertise in-house. So I think there's definitely a trend, uh, or I'm hoping that there's a trend to combine and, and bring architecture uh, you know, more closely into the development process. 
I actually don't know if I, can, if I know the answer to this. So the real estate market in New York has been very strong. And uh, the buildings that we do are mostly in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn market has thrived in the past sort of 10 years. Like, it's incredible. Like, the prices are now comparable to Manhattan. But the market has definitely softened in New York. Uh, it's a combination of uh, interest rates have gone up twice in the US recently. And also, there's a lot of product. There's a lot of apartments out that are all in the same price point because the land prices are here. So you know you can only afford to build within a certain bra um, bracket. So uh, so things have definitely slowed down there. Um, I've been talking to my friends here in the UK, and it sounds like Brexit is like destabilizing a lot of things. But everywhere I look. There is like 25 cranes, so everything seems to be pretty good uh, in London, at least. Okay. Um, first of all, I love the presentation. Great way of you know splitting up different ideas and different categories. Um, and you know uh, the idea of education and trends that we talked about. It's quite interesting because um, nowadays I feel like architects or just student, people in general, they tend to tailor the jobs for themselves. So I've seen examples of architects, you know, doing more online businesses where they sell education courses in architecture. So do you think that's the future way of how architects can uh, show themselves is to you know, find new ways uh, of combining different fields? And do you think this uh, sort of process Uh, I, I actually think that architects have relinquished so many responsibilities in the last few years. You now need a project manager in a project as well as an architect. Why? Why is this project manager getting paid more than you? You know, it's because architects used to be the project managers for these buildings. We have, in, in, I think in a quest to get rid of liability, architects have given up a lot of responsibilities and risk. But that means that you know, with, if you strip yourself of risk, you strip yourself of power. And I think that I would like to see the architects um, reclaiming their role in the building process as a central figure in, um, in our industry. Matt? Would you say that whole losing the the power of an architect has influenced the design recently. There's all the talks of concrete jungles and just big concrete blocks. Would you say as architects have had more risk with the design, it's influenced Sorry. us? As architects have had less responsibility and more risk involved with building and more involved in it all, do you think that's influenced design to be worse or better? Like the design of skyscrapers, buildings, do you think that's, do you think architects are going downhill from there with how we build? Uh, sorry, I don't know if I understand the question. Um, you, you're asking if if I think the architect role is. is you're saying is it? No worries. The um, is that I, because of all the kind of taller buildings, oh, it's not having a, a kind of negative impact on the global architect. Oh, the taller buildings? Well, just buildings yeah. in general, yeah. Like how? Sorry, uh -huh. sorry. I'll explain properly. Then. So you were saying how architects. We've lost a lot of responsibility. You're saying project managers have come in. Like, a lot of responsibility is gone. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's had a negative influence on how we design as architects? Oh, on how we design. Well, ultimately, I think that our design, um, there are two types of architects. There are the star architects, right? That they command a lot of power. They can. They are, the developer comes to them because they want Foster's name on the building, or they want Hadid's building, uh, Hadid's name on the building, and which is, uh, you know, which is how, which is why developers go to these guys. So they usually get away with a lot more. But then there is the, you know, the other eighty percent of architects, and we are very much at the mercy of what the developer says, and it's like, uh, you know, make the windows smaller. And you're like, what? 
And you have to. There's no choice. So this is the this is why I feel um, as a developer, sometimes I'm faced with very tough choices, like when I'm facing a you know a terrible budget bus, and I have to reconsider the windows size or the window operation or the number of windows. Uh, but I can make that decision uh, uh, in in a in a sort of better way in because of my architecture background. I feel like I have a better um, sense of uh, what's going to make the building better in a meaningful way. Uh, because I am not completely overburdened by the bottom line and profit making. That answers, yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Oh. Thank you for your presentation. I'd like to ask, what advice would you give us future architects when studying and learning at university? What's your advice? What advice would I give if us future architects when studying and learning at university? Well, I mean, I don't want to rattle the cage, but I would definitely demand that uh, a business education is integrated into your curriculum. I, I really encourage everybody to do that because we need to change that. I think it's very important. Um, I think it's very important to shift from the tortured artist uh, mindset to, hey, I bring value here. I am important. I can do great things. I can shape cities, and uh, and I should know how to do that rather than just doodling all day long, with without really thinking about. Um, the business side of, of our industry. So that's definitely one thing that I would uh, encourage that you guys do. And the second is just uh, think like an entrepreneur. Like just think of ways of uh, bringing work, like producing work for yourselves, rather than you know being so passive where you're just sitting waiting for clients to come through the door. <laughs> So that those that want to come to develop, would you say that we should get experience before the experience in the firm, before now, you know, with clients, or just go out with some? Now, this is a great question, and I was asked this yesterday as well. I do feel that, um, you know, getting experience in the real world is very important because you become acutely aware of, uh, in particular, uh, construction. Uh, you know, how risky, how difficult it is, how marred with problems it is. So I do think that any experience that you get in an architecture firm is going to be valuable. Um, but don't get sucked into the system and, uh, and just uh, demand uh, while you're working to be involved in, you know, every aspect of, of, the, um, of, the, build, of the project. Um, I have a question that kind of interests me is also the ethical side of your job. Yes, again, this question a lot. Um, what do you think about you know all the architects who are very passionate about you know, social projects? Um, so do you know funding for those who are new? Um, do you have any people who you know in this industry? And what do you think about the general person who wants to let's say, have a small business, but is unable to afford the development. Um, are you talking about, um, are you talking about developers that, that do sort of affordable housing, or are you, I'm not oh, sure I understand two sorry. things. So, one, um, do you know anyone on the social mm -hmm. housing market? And, I do. and is it something that you kind of take into account when doing your job? And second thing is, oh, I see. Yeah. And second thing is, uh, um, what do you think about all those people who want wanna be part of your development of your projects, but uh, don't have the funds to do so? Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is. So here's the sure. thing. Um, imagine that you buy a piece of land for the land prices are almost set, right? Like they vary obviously when 
the economy goes down, it goes a little cheaper, etc. But for example, call uh, say Brooklyn, you spend you know another four hundred dollars per square foot on top of that uh, to build that you can only sell over fourteen hundred dollars. You know what I mean? Like your 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 uh, your costs are so high to begin with that you can only like sell at a certain price point. And that price point is usually for big earners because land prices are so high. So that's kind of what drives um, a lot of the housing prices and the housing prices. In terms of affordable housing, um, when I first moved to New York, I volunteered for a affordable housing association. I mean, in New York, it's like so much worse than here that I, I don't even have time to explain. Um, and one of my desires and ambitions is, ambitions is to is to bring the concept of uh, shared ownership to the U.S. because this is something that I've never heard of, and I think it's such a brilliant idea and a way of dealing with high land costs and you know expensive construction, but offering people with a you know lower earning threshold an opportunity to buy, which is uh, something that is just not available in New York City. Okay, any more questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, we go there and then we go. I went to Excel a few months ago and there was a small talk there. And the person that was leading it said there was a difference between the man and the woman in this group. What's the difference between the other one? Well, gosh, how much time have we got? Um, the, the further you get from the creative side and the closer you get to the finance side, the more bros and, you know, boys club that it becomes. So that's one downside of uh, taking the development room. Um, but look, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? We got we to gotta go down that path and we got to break ground and we've got to stay in the workplace and try to get promoted and just keep going because it's only going to get easier for you because I did it and because somebody else did it before me like I was able to get where I am and we just need to try to change the culture especially of finance and development and, and that side of that you know those industries like we need more women there so but yeah it's a pro club <laughs> What would be the challenges that architects would face? Uh, in, in, in my field, in the sort of architect development field, again, the finance background. I, I really feel that we, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I finished uni, I knew nothing about business, like zero. And um, I was taught so much design that I became this kind of artists like all that I care about was you know that side of things and um, and I feel that it just means that you know my clients the, the developers just would not take me seriously because he was like what are you talking about you know you can't do that and I would be like well why not because it's beautiful and he'd say yeah but it doesn't make sense for my bottom line and it just means that you get dismissed as, as some dreamer and some you know a realistic person so I think that that's, um, that's the biggest challenge that you're going to face um, straight out of university, going into, um, well, trying to break into the development uh, side. Anyone else before I go to Patrick? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, it's yours. So you say that learning and employment is going to be a bit not a bit off? Yeah, definitely. But this is what I was saying. I, I feel like... You know, when I finished uni, I had no idea what I was designing because zero. It was like you know, just lines in a piece of paper. And now I have an awareness, which means that I just don't go off and you know design something that gets turned into you know how it's something that you can work within, like creating parameters that are realistic. And look, it can be a little bit shattering to you know start off there. Everybody likes to dream, but I just don't like 
see my dreams like crash down. I'd rather just start at a realistic point and work with that. Yes, Mike. Um, did you graduate in architecture first and then go into like finance and things? I'm not too sure. Like, what was your journey in like study wise? So right. what did you study to get to where you were today? Yeah, I did architecture, uh, purely architecture at Liverpool. And uh, I was just an architect. I, I did my part three and you know, the whole thing. But um, it was only when I went to New York, and that was five years ago, that I took these classes. And like I say, I mean, you know, I don't feel like I learned that much out of the classes. Uh, but it was just like, learning the language uh, that they speak. So all these like buzzwords that I was telling you, like you know, cash flowing assets and the equity capital, like all these things like I, I hadn't really heard them before. Um, so that's the yeah, that's my education. Right? Okay, um well the um thank you Vanessa. Um, the again the ethos of the department here is that Every project is that you have a client, you have a budget, and 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 you have a budget. On the other hand, they have to consider the social impact, the impact of that. So, for example, if they're working with a major client of brand in a, in a town or in a the city, they have to consider how that brand is in, in, in a different way could impact or have an impact on the much more lower uh, segment. Uh, so they, again, the students here, all of them, they go through the kind of training in terms of retail. How do you actually consider the space and the cost of the design of the retail spaces? That's great. Uh, hotel design, uh, commercial offices. Uh, but again, when it comes to the actual major project, that's when they actually go about finding all the investigation that you said about you know, the understanding of the night to day. Uh, what is the actual need in the, in the area, That's what the people that you're designing for, and then considering the cost of that project in relation to the funding and so on and so forth. So, in a sense, I think, again, the, what you talk, the whole essence of your talk in relation to the ethos of what Ravensbourne and as a whole institution does is on the as to kind of make sure every designer, doesn't matter if you're not a tech and design products and so on, you have to know. Um, about finding your own client and finding your own project. So it was, it was really, really useful. That's great. Thank That's you great very much. Thank you. Thank you.